Hello, can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Amandishi. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> uh, welcome, everybody, to today's lecture. Uh, <clears throat> I wish to talk about antibiotic resistance in the dental practice. Uh, since Alexander Fleming, uh, about in 1928, have discovered um, penicillin, antibiotics has, has become the modern cornerstone of our, um, of our, of our medical practice um, since then. It, uh, these drugs have become a prerequisite for preventive and curative measures and for protecting patients from potentially fatal diseases, ensuring that uh, complex procedures such as surgeries and uh, chemotherapy uh, are provided at a low risk. So uh, there has been a systematic misuse and overuse of these drugs in humans, in medicine, in food production, and, and this has driven up the resistance uh, to these drugs. And the patterns differs from country to country, from region to region. But uh, today we want to, uh, my slides are not moving. How can I do this? Okay. Yeah, they're not moving. Yeah, yeah, they're not moving, right? <laughs> so, yeah, the important um, the importance of antibiotics. This cannot be overemphasized. I know we spend uh, a lot of time in the in medical school learning about these um, these chemicals. Antibiotics are definitely a cornerstone of um, of modern medicine. Effective antibiotic uh, uh, drugs are crucial to protect people from potential fatal diseases. And they also reduce the risk from complex procedures such as chemotherapy, organ transplant, and other surgeries. When it comes to our area, uh, antibiotics help us to stop uh, the spread of oral dental infections in patients. So they are very vital uh, in our practice. And also sepsis and the spread of infection towards vital structures. It may occur rapidly in patients with oral dental infections. And these conditions can be life threatening, as we were shown last week by Dr. Mungani, that uh, we, may, we need these things to control those potentially fatal um, uh, cervical facial lesions. So the overuse and misuse of these anti antibiotics have driven up the resistance. And this comes at a cost both to our health and to our wealth. So, so we need these things to work. So you will find that uh, if we continue in this trajectory, it will come a time when we need these things to work and then they will not be working. So that will be a very big issue for us. So our focus today is going to be threefold. I'm going to present on a global overview of the microbial resistance so that we appreciate um, how this revolt, the revolt of these microorganisms against the chemicals have permeated the very aspect of our existence. And also I'm going to discuss how this problem directly affects the dental community, our practices, our patients, our families, um, uh, and also our, um, our friends. So I'm also going to show how we got into this situation and what we can do to change it, both as concerned citizens and as dental health um, uh, practitioners. So on the overview, on the overview, we're going to see that um, as antibiotic drugs become increasingly inefficient, due to the development of the development and spread of the resistant infections. 
even minor surgeries or routine operations could become high risk procedures leading to prolonged illnesses and, um, and increased mortality. Without, this, if, if, without effective antibiotics, the success of modern medicine, as we know it, uh, is going to be compromised. And the treatment failures are going to persist, among other things. So we are going to discuss the overuse and misuse of antibiotics, which is causing the resistance. I'm also going to show that the antibiotic resistance is a significant threat to our health and our wealth and how it affects our, our families and our friends. So we were shown this, um, uh, this slide last week by Dr. Mungani, uh, how antibiotic discovery, discoveries have progressed from the 1920s up to the 2015s, and we can also see how also the, the antibiotic resistance has increased uh, in the years. So we see that we only there's a void of discovery there in that the development of antibiotic resistance is also increasing and is continuing every day. Uh, we should not confuse ourselves here because this is a truly a biological warfare because what is happening is new drugs are being designed by humans and these drugs will become obsolete through bacterial mutations, only to be replaced by new drugs. And new bacterial mutations will also take place, and this is going to be a cis or better. So this is the biological warfare we are fighting, and it will depend on which side you are. Some of uh, the clinicians are on the sides of, the, of these, uh, these microbial agents. So you will see that the uncritical and the promiscuous use of antibiotics leads to the persistence of strains of bacteria that you will resist their action. Should this happen, it will have serious epidemiological significance. Some countries have already re, are already reporting that about 42% of infections are resistant to common therapies. So we are in for a trouble. So if we, if this antimicrobial resistance continues to increase, it has been estimated that by 2050, infect, infections resistant to drugs will be the number one cause of death globally with 10 million people dying every year. So you see where we are now, the where this blue is, that's where we are. There's an estimate of about 700,000. That's a low estimate of antimicrobial resistance, people dying annually from antimicrobial resistance. If you check with road accidents, people dying are about 1.2 million, and people who are going to die with cancer in about in 2050, most of us will be, will be elderly by then, and we, that's the time when we will need these agents to help us cope with our health. But cancer will be surpassed by antimicrobial resistance. So we see this is a silent uh, pandemic, which is, which is actually happening under our nose. And if we don't take action now, it is going to be a global problem. By 2050, we will see that about 10 million people will be dying annually because of, um, because of antimicrobial resistance. So uh, this chart has been produced by the World Health Organization showing the misuse and overusing of antibiotics that it will put us all at risk. You see that even though antibiotics are life-saving drugs, uh, and when you need them, you really want them to work. But as a patient or as a doctor, when you prescribe these agents to, the, to your patient, you really want them to work. And when you take them you yourself, when you are suffering from a, any infection, you really want these agents to work. But the overuse and the misuse of them, which is happening nowadays, uh, will cause, will put us all at risk, our families and our friends. So this, uh, this pattern, if this pattern continues, we are going to breed super, uh, super bugs as we, as we go on. 
So I will show how antibiotic um, resistance occurs. One of the principal ways in which antibiotic resistance happens is when people are unnecessarily and overly exposed to antibiotics. Whilst antibiotics kill or impede the growth of bacteria that are susceptible to them, this bacteria, the, those bacteria that remain unaffected by them are left to flourish. This process is known as natural, natural selection. No, not just the bacteria that cause infections are affected by this selection process. Uh, antibiotics also affect the body's entire microbiome. Even the good bacteria is affected. That's resulting in an imbalance that can seriously affect an individual's overall health and well-being. So they kill those that are susceptible and the strains that are not susceptible, they are left to flourish. And this is how natural selection to antibiotics spreads. There's also another um, type of antibacterial selection, which happens, uh, I call it the, micro the microbial revolt, which is happening. Suffice to say that the microbes have an incredible, incredible ability to outwit humans by formulating enzymes that one destroy the antibiotic, two that limit the access of the drug uh, to its microbial target sites, altering the drug target sites to reduce antibiotic binding or actively extruding the antibiotic from the microbial cell. We know that some antibiotics like metronidazole have essentially only one mode of resistance, which is altering the, the binding site of the, of the antibiotic. But some antibiotics like the tetracyclines, they have got all these four type of mechanisms. So that's how uh, these microbial re revolt um, take place. So the microbes no longer defend themselves from chemicals by single chromosomal mutations. But now, because of their massive exposure to sustained chemical onslaught, they easily and are rapidly transferring antimicrobial resistant genes via bacteriophages, plasmids, transpons, and integrins. So this is now a genetic thing. They are now transferring uh, resistant genes from one type of bacteria to another to resist this, uh, this chemical onslaught, which is coming to them. Uh, by use of uh, unwarranted and promiscuous use of antibiotics. Uh, no longer do they sit idly by when they are confronted by these to toxic chemicals, but rather they manage to express or transfer these genes that is induced the resistance. We're talking about um, natural selection. Now this induced resistance. That this now happens much more rapidly than the than the, than the natural selection, um, all right? So you will see that these genes transfer, they are much more rapid if the chem, the, than when the chemical was not, was not present. So this continued exposure to antibiotics. The bacteria, they also mutate rapidly than when a person is not exposed to, uh, to the to, to antibiotics. So how does this problem directly affect the dental community? Uh, resistance uh, to the antibiotics is a personal problem for everyone, for every one of us. Uh, it is a universal issue that could affect anyone, including you, your friend, and your family. I keep on repeating this so that uh, you understand it that it affects everyone, your family, yourself, and your, and your patients. Uh, at this time, most people, most of us, do not personally know anyone affected by antibiotic resistance or do not immediately connect specific issues like failure of antibiotics to treat a patient, a patient's infection uh, with a broader issue of resistance. However, there are many, many, many cases out there uh, on the internet, everywhere in the medical journals of people affected. But ourselves, we may not connect personally to, to these things or know or connect to patients who have suffered these things. But most of these uh, things um, are happening out there. There is a case which happened in South Africa 
Uh, it's a well-known case that was published in the FDI uh, journal about Vanessa Carter from South Africa, a survivor of a drug-resistant infection. Uh, she suffered multiple fractures from a road traffic accident several years, and she received um, several prostate, uh, facial pro prosthetics and implants. And the infection associated with one of the implants spread with multiple, it was treated with multiple causes of antibiotic and required a decade of surgeries to manage. Imagine surgery was required to remove the prosthetic that tested positive to methylcellin resistant staphylococcus aureus. Two years after the MESA was clear, a maxillofacial and plastic surgeon performed a zygomatic osteotomy and flip surgery to repair the damage. Vanessa is now a patient advocating for antimicrobial resistance. So this is a case which happened um, at our next door. And when I followed this case, it's too big to present here. She actually went through over about 10 years with, um, uh, with the problem of, um, uh, of MESA, which was resistant to multiple anti, uh, antibiotics. So, this is how we get where we are now. And this is how the dental community is affected. Dentists are responsible for about 10% of antibiotic prescriptions globally. A country and country differs, but I think also here in Zimbabwe, we are not spared. So we see that the overuse of dentists has been widely reported. Even in the UK, it was found that 80 per, an 80% rate of unnecessary use of antibiotics for treating dental conditions. Imagine 80% for treating dental conditions was found to be unnecessary in the UK. Well, a US study found an 80% rate of inappropriate use for prophylaxis. So these guys, they've got 80% unnecessary use and these guys have got 80% inappropriate use of, um, of antibiotics. And uh, as the dental profession is responsible for around 10%, you, it, was, it was found that only 12% of dentists prescribe antibiotics correctly. They prescribe them when they are necessary and when they are appropriate. Only 12%. So 88% of us guys are doing it the wrong way. The dental community is an opportunity to contribute significantly to slowing the development and the spread of antimicrobial resistance by optimizing uh, our, our prescribing. <clears throat> so it was also found that dentists prescribe differently uh, as compared to other, um, to, other, to, to other medical clinicians. Dentists prescribe penicillins most frequently, especially the amino penicillins. That's what you prescribe uh, frequently, the prospectrum antibiotics. And in the, especially in the US, clindamycin is more frequently prescribed by dentists. More antibiotics are prescribed for preventative reasons by, 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 by dentists. Uh, yeah. Dentists also have a higher visit based antibiotic prescribing than the medical clinicians. So compared to our medical colleagues, uh, when it comes to prescribing uh, antibiotics per visit, we are prescribing more antibiotics to patients, uh, mostly maybe for prophylaxis, maybe for preventative or for treating acute conditions. And also it was found that we are more pressured to prescribe antibiotics by patients and other medical clinicians than other medical cl uh, clinicians. We are pressured to, to do this. And especially these days where people uh, going to the UK, I found many people going to the UK saying, ah, may, can you prescribe me antibiotics so that I can take them to the UK? It's not easy to find antibiotics there. And even friends in the UK calling, can you give so and so coming to the UK a packet of antibiotics? They are not easy to get by in the UK. It's because of this, uh, the trend which is happening to the, 
to the to the to the microbials which are revolting against these chemicals. Uh, studies have also shown that despite efforts to reduce dental antibiotic use, too many antibiotics are still being prescribed by dentists. Dentists are still uh, prescribing a lot of uh, antibiotics. So, uh, <clears throat> Louis Sweeney uh, and, and colleagues uh, uh, in their research antibiotic resistance in general um, dental practice, a cause of concern, uh, have shown that uh, on a behavioral, based on a behavioral uh, theory study, has shown that the decision whether to prescribe dental antibiotics is both multifaceted and complex. For example, while most dentists know about antimicrobial resistance, a key factor relating to their decision whether to prescribe antibiotics for acute dental condition was found to relate to their beliefs about their ability to provide operative procedures during unscheduled appointments. So this is what, me, what it means is, when dentists are faced with unscheduled appointments or they are in a hurry, uh, they just prescribe antibiotics. When someone comes with an acute dental condition uh, and they think they are not prepared to do that procedure, it takes a lot of time to, to do this RCT or, or do that and that, it was shown that dentists are more prone in, that, in those conditions to prescribe antibiotics. I even need to think, ah, go get amoxicillin and metronidazole. You'll be fine. Someone is failing to do an of in inferior of your nerve block. He's saying, ah, no, you are not, you, the anesthetic is not working on you. Go get uh, some antibiotics come after three days. That is what is happening. And those the people who are not comfortable with their root canals or they are under pressure from patients, they just prescribe antibiotics. So this suggests that the antimicrobial stewardship interventions should focus on supporting dentists to optimize care for patients with acute conditions, such as extractions and treating purple disease, rather than concentrating only on antibiotic prescribing. So you need to take note of this, that when a resistance occurs, the reason that occurs when, uh, when a patient takes antibiotic, has been shown in clinical studies to persist in that patient microbiome for up to 12 months. Furthermore, the bacteria develop resistance not only to the causative drug, but to several others as well. So it's not that they are only going to be resistant to, to, to the penicillin. That resistance is also going to be induced uh, for other antimicrobial agents. Exposing a patient to antibiotics when not necessary, for example, you just, just in case you need it, you give a patient or to meet a patient's demand. That increases that patient's risk to that, that the antibiotics will fail when they really need it. So we should avoid just dishing out antibiotics like tissues that are rally. So how we got into this situation? It was mainly by two things, as I've alluded before. Antibiotic misuse in dentistry primarily involves the use of antibiotics in inappropriate situations or for too, for too long a period of time. I will first dwell on this. Respect with the, how, to, how we are prescribing antibiotics, uh, that we are prescribing them for too long a period of time. And also we are also prescribing them in inappropriate situations. So what was once a magic bullet is now has now been replaced by a shotgun. Those who are familiar with shotguns, it will just spread those balls everywhere. It's no longer one use to, 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 to solve a lot of problems. We are now taking multiple solutions just to treat one, uh, one problem. So the use of antibiotics for a long time, what do I mean? Antibiotics should be used aggressively and for as short a time as compatible with the patient remission of disease. In infectious diseases that do not rebound, rebound, those that do not retain after stopping the antibiotic, such as oral dental infections, the proper duration of antibiotic 
is determined by the time it takes for the patient's host defense to gain control of the infection. So if the patient is now able to fight the infection, we should stop the antibiotic. We should, know, we should not just continue to eaten it with the drugs, no. We should monitor, and then when the patient is able to fight the, the infection, we stop the antibiotic. With oral facial infections, the antibiotic is terminated when the infection is resolved or is reasonably certain to resolve. The use of antibiotics for too long a duration, and particularly at sub-inhibitory concentrations, greatly increases microbial resistance. Remember, we said this the onslaught of, 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 of bacteria with these chemicals, it actually increases their ability to transfer resistant genes from one to another. So we should use them aggressively as short a time as possible. So the duration for antibiotics can vary significantly due to the following factors. Uh, so the duration uh, can vary significantly due to the following factors. The ability to incise or drain the infection. If you have got the ability to incise, that time should be very short for the antibiotics. What's the medical status in response to infection? The growth rate and virulence of the infection. That affects the time of the antibiotic. The ability of the antibiotic to diffuse into the infection site. That is the pharma dynamics in the pharmacokinetics of the of the drugs presence of resistance bacteria is there presence of resistant bacteria or not or the antibiotic choice and dose so having said that we will see that the old adage that, that antibiotics should be given for x number of days maybe 5 10 14 or whatever to kill resistant strains is an oxymoron in itself. Since the bacteria that are resistant are by definition unaffected by the antibiotic. So there's no need of spending 10 days giving, you saying the bacteria are resistant, no. By definition, they, if they are resistant, they are going to be resistant even if you pump two tons of amoxicillin into that uh, patient. Uh, while it is true, that some bacteria may occasionally mutate to resistant in a stepwise fashion. After several generations, uh, over several generations, and that prolonged antibiotic therapy may kill or inhibit these mutations before they gain full resistance. It does not reflect the, the reality of how resistance operates today. So virtually all microbial resistance occurs by the transfer of resistant genes from, from microorganisms that already are resistant to the antibiotic. So prolonged antibiotic use over what is necessary will only select uh, for those often highly resistant strains and pose a much greater risk for human health than failing to inhibit a few isolated mutants. So if you continue to give it for a long, long period of time, you're actually breeding superbugs. Those are only really selecting those that are resistant. Was the re only the resistant one will survive? Then they are the only ones which are going to 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 to, to, to proliferate and survive. So if you say the the mutate in a stepwise fashion, yeah, that's true. But today, according to the researches, because of the transfer of resistant genes, this resistance they happen so so quickly. So flooding the microbials with with antibiotics will actually increase their resistance. Because those isolated few mutants will grow into be, to be superbugs. There's also this saying, which we, which we always say, one should finish the course of the antibiotics. This is a reasonable when you are dealing with the rebound infections. But however, this is predicated on the assumption that the prescribing health practitioner actually knows beforehand precisely how long the infection is going to last. Uh, unless if you, are a, if you have got the preciseness of a Jewish prophet of knowing when this infection is going to, to last, 
you can say you tend to take it for 10 days and finish it after 10 days. That would be good. But this is often unlikely due to the patient and the drug variables. Uh, even the experts make this mistake by assuming that the cause of infection is predictable from its onset, that the Uh, sorry, that the practitioner knows precisely what the clinical course will be, or that the 10 day therapy established for the treatment of streptococcal sore throat fits all infections. Because what we actually do is that uh, we know uh, uh, that uh, streptococcal sore throat is treated in 10 days by uh, augmenting. Then we say that whenever we prescribe augmenting, we say 10 days. That is actually a mistake. Only the wise practitioner will follow the progress of the infection until its termination. And until when you are sure that is ready to, to, to resolve. So I talked about the inappropriate use of antibiotics. Uh, so there are, well, uh, these are the inappropriate uses we are using the antibiotics as the dental profession. Giving antibiotics after a dental procedure is co is completed is an otherwise in an otherwise healthy patient to prevent an infection, which in all likelihood will not will not okay anyway. Is that when we complete a procedure and then we give a patient antibiotics? to prevent an infection, which is unlikely to okay. That in itself is not wise. And it's not necessary. Because the use of antibiotic to prevent post-treatment uh, infections uh, violates the principle of prophylaxis in itself. Because if you want to prevent uh, an infection, you give a loading dose before the procedure. And so that when you do the, the, the surgical procedure and you expect that there's going to be bacteremia, there, there should be already, the antibiotic should be already in the system. So if you give an antibiotic to prevent any infection, which might not okay anyway, it will not work. Because by the time you give the antibiotic, the antibiotic will, will reach its maximum level in the serum about 12 hours after, after taking it, by that time, the body would have already decided the way that the infection is going to establish or not. So, so giving an, a, an, an antibiotic after a completed procedure in itself is not good, but people always do that. Uh, maybe they are, not, uh, com they are not comfortable with their procedure or they are not uh, uh, what can I say? They are not confident of their root canals. So that after a root canal, then you give a, an antibiotic. If you do your root canal properly, then there's, there will be no need for, for an antibiotic. So some of us are using antibiotics as analgesics, particularly in endodontics. Uh, so we need to know that the use of antibiotics as analgesics to treat post-operative pain is irrational, as there are better drugs available for that. In most studies indicate that antibiotics do not relieve post-operative edema, pain, or trismus. So we are employing antibiotics for, prop for prophylaxis in patients not at risk of metastatic bacteremia. Using antibacterial, using antibacterial uh, to treat chronic adult periodontitis, which is almost totally responsive to mechanical treatment. And also using antimicrobial therapy in lieu of mechanical therapy in periodontitis management. Uh, using antibiotics and antimicrobials chronically in periodontitis. That is misuse. Of, uh, of those drugs. Using antibiotics instead of surgical incision and drainage of infections. Someone comes with a, 
with the swelling, when you just see that this is pus, and you give antibiotics and, and you, you tell them to go on. That's not, in, that's not indicated. Using antibiotics to prevent claims of negligence. I have seen a patient a while ago uh, who came to my practice complaining of post, uh, post extraction pain <clears throat> for, for several weeks. And they have been uh, from a certain dentist where they had an extraction. And they were just being pumped antibiotics, antibiotic after antibiotic, antibiotic after antibiotic. And the dentist not even trying to see what is happening. I saw the patient, uh, I saw the socket, it was not healing. And then I took a, a biopsy, an incisional biopsy I sent to the lab. And it came as a, a it was, it was cancer, it came as cancer. So sometimes when a patient does come complaining of pain, you are not supposed just to pump antibiotics. Because antibiotics will not you post-operative pain, it will not you trismus. And some just give them so that they cover their, if they think they have negligence, they just want to cover their tracks. They, they go on to do that. <clears throat> so the global anti the research by Thomas Palash uh, about the global antimicrobial resistance and its impact on the dental community, he found that when antibiotics are employed, six things may occur. Only the first one uh, is good. The antibiotic may aid the immune system to gain control of infection. Then the other things which, may, which might okay, toxicity or allergy may okay. Already resistant microbes may be selected for and a super infection may result. Uh, four, the antimicrobial may promote microbial microsomal mutations. Gene transfer may okay, may be encouraged from the resistant to the non-resistant microbes when you give antibiotics. Latent resistant genes in, in microbials may be uh, expressed. So these are the things which might, uh, which might okay, risk of uh, antibiotic use. We see that um, there are benefits and there are risk. So, 10% of the patients actually they present with a uh, side effect. Uh, most of these patients are, uh, may not come back to you with those side effects. They may go to a GP and you might not know. They might also be a one to 10% of patients might have allergic reactions. Uh, and in the US, they've also found that the ESC difficile uh, infection in patients causing megacolon and um, pseudomembranous colitis. And which, which has got a 6% uh, uh, mortality. And also, there might be a resistant pathogens which might be selected with 1% mortality. There are also benefits of uh, antimicrobial use. Post extraction infections are prevented in one to four patients. Dental implant failures are prevented in one to 7% of patients. Uh, then infective endocarditis patients, they are helped in those uh, in this situation, situations and also in prosthetic joint infections. So we see that people uh, or dentists or clinicians are now using uh, antibiotics as drugs of fear just to cover their errors of omission or commission or thereby prevent claims of negligence. So if they are not sure about their diagnosis or they are not sure about their, their procedures or their treatment, they just want to cover the patient on antibiotics. Just in case something happens, the patient will be, will be, will be okay. Uh, and in hospitals, approximately one half of all antibiotics employed in hospitals are in patients without signs and symptoms of infections, according to Thomas Palash and his colleagues. And in many cases, they are used to prevent infections 
or to ensure all was done to prevent later criticisms. Uh, in hospital, one third are used empirically. You just say, ah, uh, that's a peripheral abscess. Take amoxicillin and metronidazole. And one third are used for prophylaxis. Uh, and one third they are used after culture and sensitivity test. So I will repeat that statement again. The magic bullet has now been replaced by a shotgun just to cover everything. So these are uh, bad habits. But we need to know one thing that antibiotic use, uh, antibiotic use is not benign therapy. You might think giving uh, amoxicillin is, is benign therapy. No, that's not benign therapy. A dentist, uh, uh, these are case studies. A dentist in America prescribed coamoxicillin to a patient with pulpitis from a heavily restored molar. Uh, there was no history of allergy to the antibiotic, and the patient did not want antibiotic treatment. Uh, a drug induced vasculitis developed and required six months of medical treatment, which with an immunomodulating drug. The dentist was held liable for all the patient's medical costs because there were no justifiable clinical grounds for the use of the antibiotic. He was just supposed to do a root canal. In another case, a healthy 19-year-old patient was given peroperative prophylactic antibiotics for elective maxillofacial surgery to correct excessive uh, maxillary gingival show when smiling and domesticated dysfunction. She acquired a Clostridium difficile infection and after a prolonged stay in hospital, she was left with life-changing abdominal surgery. Well, she underwent a subtotal colectomy and ileostomy. Uh, in another case, a 35-year-old stockbroker and a father of two underwent endodontic therapy in the United States. He was prescribed prophylactic clindamycin, and as a result, developed toxic megacolon as a result of Clostridium difficile infection. A few days later, he died. A, the suit for malpractice was filed by the patient's widow, which was settled a, in court. So you will see that prescribing medication, especially antibiotics, when there is no clinical basis for it, cannot be in patient's best interest and could amount to negligence. So what can we do to change it? The most difficult thing uh, uh, and the most difficult challenge in control of microbial resistance is to convince all people, especially healthcare practitioners and patients alike, that everyone is responsible for the problem and its solution. So what should we do? The sun should never set on an undrained pass. The sun should never set on an undrained pass. Antibiotics are almost never a substitute for surgical drainage of an infected area for a number of reasons. One, antibiotics do not diffuse well into infected areas. Two, the blood supply to abscesses is usually compromised. Some antibiotics do not work well at the acidic pH of abscesses. So microorganisms may be dividing slowly or not at all, particularly in older abscesses, thereby negating the effect of penicillins and cephalosporins that act only on dividing organisms. High levels of antibiotic inhibitors, beta lactamases, may be present in abscesses. So it is better to give a surgical procedure and the patient go home than to give a patient antibiotics and let them go home. In most of the cases, you'd have done nothing if you just give them main antibiotics and tell them to go home. You're actually breeding um, antimicrobial resistance. So occasionally, an infected area is not, uh, there are some in infected areas which are not amenable to incision and drainage. 
such as in pericoronitis or injurated cellulitis. And antibiotics are the only available treatment. But this exception should not be taken as a rule. The, those are the only uh, exceptions which are the where you cannot incise and drain. So when you have to give them the, the antibiotic. So tackling antibiotic resistance, uh, the antimicrobial um, resistance, uh, the antibiotic uh, stewardship. What we should do is to raise awareness to our patients, to our families, to our friends on how to use um, a, antibiotics properly. We need to, to practice effective infection control protocols in our surgeries so that we, we prevent infections, even when we, especially when we are doing surgical procedures. So, for example, it was published by the FDI. We should give more education on how to prevent the, to the decay so that we prevent infections, so that we use less antibiotics, so that we don't breed microbial resistance. Tell them to, to avoid sugars, to use a fluoridated toothpaste, because antibiotics do not cure toothache. Antibiotics do not cure toothache. Pain relief is best achieved by a dental procedure, not a prescription. So I have looked around for some clinical guidelines uh, published in different countries on how to use uh, antibiotics in dental practice. Uh, so you will see that the antibiotic uh, calls for proper evidence-based evidence-based clinical guidelines, uh, like in the use of um, uh, antibiotics here. So you see, when a patient has got uh, irreversible papitis in Australia, England, and United States, antibiotics are not indicated in those guidelines. Even when a patient has got apical periodontitis, the Australian, England, and the American guidelines do not recommend antibiotics for apical periodontitis. So in acute uh, apical abscesses, without, without, without systemic involvement, when there's no systemic involvement, uh, the England uh, guidelines, they do not recommend antibiotics. The United States one and the, the Australian one, they recommend, they, when dental treatment is available, they don't recommend antibiotics. But when dental treatment is not available within 24 hours, in Australia, you can be given penicillin and metronidazole for five days. Uh, in the United States, they say if dental treatment is not available within 72 hours, so if, if the patient can go to a dental facility within 72 hours, there's no need of um, antibiotic treatment because there's no systematic involvement. But if dental treatment is not available, they can now be given um, penicillin or amoxicillin. So you see the United States guidelines, they point to a monotherapy of antibiotic. Maybe only a penicillin or a amino penicillin. Or if they are, aller they are allergic, they're going to be given azithromycin or another drug for three to seven days. But in, in, in Britain, it's not the case. So when there's an acute uh, apical abscess with the systemic involvement, that's when uh, antibiotics are, are indicated. You can give metronidazole with a penicillin. Uh, in, in the UK, they they advocate for, for monotherapy. Not what we do that you give amoxicillin and metronidazole. No? You just go for a monotherapy, just a penicillin or amoxicillin. Then a penicillin IV, then you'll be fine. Or an alternative, you can give metronidazole, IV or clarithromycin. Same as in the, in the Americas. So you see that also, in the treatment of periodontal diseases, 
uh, it's not there. The guidelines also show that it's not necessary uh, in acute periodontal infections to give uh, antibiotics. You should give, you should first do the mechanical treatment, the mechanical debridement that will give, um, that will give a relief uh, to the patient. So the use of uh, a, doxycycline as an adjunct to periodontal care for extended periods of time uh, in lieu of periodontal subgingival instrumentation uh, has been shown that there is no proper evidence considering the risk benefits to the patient. There is no proper evidence for, uh, for that. And that violates the cardinal principle of infection control. Because the cardinal principle of infection control is remove the source of infection. That's what should be done. So these are the evidences. This is um, the need for antibiotic um, uh, antibiotics. So this is a Cochrane review, which was done in 2021, to show the need uh, for treatment for patients to be given an uh, antibiotic prophylaxis for a tooth extraction. So number needed to treat 19. It means that you needed to treat 19 patients on, antibi on antibiotic to give them antibiotics just only to, treat, to, to, to be effective for one treatment. So you need to give 19 people so that you can cover and treat for one person. Or for preventing dry socket, you need to give antibiotic prophylaxis for 46 patients just only for you to be able to treat for one patient. So there was no difference in fever and swelling and pain. So due to the increase in prevalence of uh, bacteria which are resistant to treatment by current available antibiotics, clinicians should consider carefully whether treating healthy patients with antibiotics to prevent infection is likely to do good more than, likely to do more harm than good. Uh, in another review, a Cochrane review done in 2013 for the use of antibiotic prophylaxis in tooth implants. Uh, they show, they'd shown that the NNT needed to treat 25 patients in order to cover one patient uh, to prevent fail of an implant on one patient with uh, two grams of prophylactic amoxicillin. This review was uh, This was done and reviewed by other researchers in 2019, published in Journal of American Dental Association. Uh, and it showed, and the results showed that uh, the indiscriminate use of antibiotics in healthy patient was not warranted. So we, should, we really need to consider our guidelines on prophylaxis, whether we're doing implants or extractions or in periodontitis. So also still talking about um, antibiotic prophylaxis uh, to prevent distant site infections. There is a knowledge gap uh, here, whether the secondary bacteria, bacteremia will be causing the infection or it is the bacteremia from our daily oral hygiene, from, the, from our mouth or whatever, which contributes to infective endocarditis or a prosthetic joint infection. So IE stands for infective endocarditis and PJI, prosthetic joint infection. So data linking to bacteremia induced during dental procedure and infective endocarditis, the data is mixed. The, uh, the strongest evidence suggests that dental procedures are not associated with the prosthetic joint infections. So definitive evidence on the effective of antibiotic prophylaxis for infective endocarditis or um, a prosthetic joint infections have not been determined. Uh, that is so in infective endocarditis and prosthetic joint infections, if occurred in patients taking antibiotic prophylaxis prior to dental procedures. Uh, so infective endocarditis prophylaxis guidelines, most countries recommend 
prophylaxis in cardiac patients at high risk. But for prostatic joint infections, uh, the guidelines, most countries do not have recommended prophylaxis in patients with prostatic joints. So in conclusion, uh, the global problem of antimicrobial resistance to antibiotics is serious, not only in its extent, but also in the rapidity with which microorganisms are attaining and maintaining resistance. We must fully appreciate that uh, penicillin brought more curative power to a barefoot uh, uh, health provider in Africa than the collective powers of all physicians in the New York City. But uh, when we misuse it, we are taking that power away from, from that doctor. So it is time for us all to become part of the solution, not the problem. After all, our lives depend upon it. So the tale of microbial resistance will continue for some time to come, but hopefully with good news, it will be taken seriously in all quarters and readiness of the problem is forthcoming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hamandisha, for a very informative lecture. Um, I encourage members of the forum who may have any questions to post on the chat platform. We have a question that came through from Dr. Jui, which was saying, is there a higher risk of developing resistance if the patient has had the same antibiotic in the previous 12 month period? Yes, is there a higher risk of developing resistance if the patient has had the same antibiotic in the previous, in the previous cough month period? Uh, is, does it mean the patient has been on antibiotic for cough months or has he had that same, that type within cough months? So um, I will say if it's uh, that the patient has got the, the antibiotic in the last cough month and it was used correctly, there is no risk of developing resistance. Resistance all, only comes when there is uh, improper use and also when it is being given for too long a period which is not necessary so that the bacteria are being flooded unnecessarily by the antibiotic. That's when the, the resistance comes in. Okay. Thank you for that response. Next comment uh, and contribution came from Dr. Bayou. Thanks for this excellent lecture. I hope we're all listening and I hope we shall all take your advice of appropriate prescription. However, in Zimbabwe, our colleague nurses are worst at carrying antibiotics and dishing it to every relative. I have explained the harm their relative is doing to them after he is or she is gone. Any input on that, Dr. Amandisha? Uh, colleagues, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. I've also uh, come across that uh, that case several times. And even yesterday, I also received a call from the guys in the UK that their relative is coming to the UK. So can you just send us as many antibiotics as you can? Because they are not easily available here. Uh, even for flu, someone has got flu give them azithromycin. Someone has got this one, give them this. That is a trend which is actually happening in Zimbabwe. So I think in Zimbabwe, we're actually sitting on a time bomb because we are easily giving people antibiotics. Both and we think we are, we are really treating them, but we are actually doing, the, we are actually killing our relatives and doing them um, a disservice. Because when they really need it, when they will come a time when they need these things, they will not work when they really want them. Thank you very much, Dr. Bay. Um, another question, what is the current guidelines for antibiotic prophylaxis for infective endocarditis and people with joint implants? The UK says the harm of the antibiotics is greater compared to the number um, that, that the will, the risk of endocarditis. Yes. As I have shown in my in that other, um, other review, uh, the Cochrane review on the effectiveness of, um, I think it was the 39th slide, that uh, most of the countries, they recommend uh, the prophylaxis in patients who are at risk. 
and that should be real prophylaxis, giving a loading dose uh, prior to the surgery, not after the surgery. But in people with the joint uh, implants, there was no evidence to show that uh, to show that uh, antibiotics are effective. Actually, in both cases, people who were on prophylaxis on uh, before a dental procedure, they were all actually shown to develop endocarditis uh, after after the dental procedure. So maybe they were not given correctly. But the American Dental, the American Cardiac Association, Art Association, uh, they recommend that we give only to those who are susceptible uh, to it. Thank you, Doc. At this point, there are no more questions, but just uh, positive comments. Excellent presentation, Doc. Thank you for a well, for a very necessary, well researched and informative lecture. And thank you for the thought-provoking presentation. So thank you so much to Dr. Amandishi for taking your time to take us through this well-prepared uh, and informative lecture. And thank you everyone for taking your time to show up for today's CPDA's lecture. If there are not any other comments or questions, this is where our lecture ends today. Thank you very much.